Thank you. And uh, thank you in particular for being here at such an early time in the morning. I, I know that by CCC standards, this is the crack of dawn. <laughs> So I'm Alex Halderman. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Michigan in the U.S. And uh, the work I'm going to be telling you about today um, is primarily uh, collaborative work with others. Uh, I have to thank in particular my students, Drew Springle, Travis Finkenauer, Zakir Darumarich, and our collaborators, Jason Kitkat, Hari Hursty, and Maggie McAlpine. This work would not be possible without them. In fact, um, three of my students who have worked on e-voting research with me are here today. Uh, Eric Wistra, Zakir Darumarich, and Drew Springle. If you guys could please stand up. All right, applause for the students. They really do the work. All right, so e-voting is something that's been an interest of mine for about the last 10 years. And it's an interest of mine in particular um, because it sounds like it would be something so wonderful to be able to uh, use computers to count votes securely, to be able to vote over the internet with all of the convenience that the technology brings. Perhaps we could reduce costs, perhaps we could increase participation. At the same time, e-voting raises some of the most difficult challenges in the field of computer security. And so I see it as a motivating example, a motivating problem for advances of all kinds in cryptography, in systems construction, in usability. E-voting is a really hard security problem because of its unusual requirements. We need two things in a secure e-voting system above all else. One of them is integrity, and by integrity, I mean that the outcome of the election matches the voter's intent. This is a relatively weak definition of integrity. Let's just at least say that the right guy wins. This means, of course, that votes have to be cast as voters intended and that the election result has to be counted as the votes are cast. But the second requirement, and the reason that this is more complicated than other problems that we more routinely solve, things like banking online and making uh, purchases in electronic commerce, is we also have this requirement for ballot secrecy. Right, the secret ballot, which is one of the most important technological advances in the history of election technology, the secret ballot, the thing that protects you from being coerced into voting a certain way and protects us from you uh, selling your ballot. The secret ballot says that no one can figure out how you voted, even if you try to prove to them how you voted. This is what we want to prevent people from being coerced and prevent them from selling ballots. And the reason that e-voting is a difficult problem is largely that these two properties, integrity and ballot secrecy, are in tension. Many defenses that we might normally try to uh, use to increase integrity, things like we do in electronic commerce to send people a receipt or a bank statement or to do accounting where we uh, have just a, a big table where all the money in and out uh, is totaled and we make sure they're in agreement. These things are very, very difficult or impossible to implement if we want to maintain a secret ballot in a strong form at the same time as we're trying to preserve integrity. So we need very different mechanisms to achieve an e-voting system that provides these critical properties. Now, of course, that hasn't stopped people from building electronic voting systems. And many countries around the world use e-voting or, or, or are starting to try internet voting. And uh, I've been very lucky over the past uh, few years to have been involved in some of the first hands-on studies of these different systems. For instance, in 2007, I was part of a team at Princeton that uh, did the first hands-on security analysis by an independent party of an e-voting machine used in the U.S. This thing, the Diebold AccuVote TS, was the most widely used e-voting machine in the United States at the time. Um, the manufacturer was very secretive about uh, the technology. They uh, assured people that, oh, of course, it's perfectly secure, but uh, no, how it works is a secret. You can't know. Now, of course, that's very rarely ever a good sign. Um, it was after several years of uh, debate without knowing the facts that finally a whistleblower gave one of these machines 
uh, to our research group at Princeton. And uh, some of these stories, I mean, you you can't make you can't make them up. I mean, uh, after seeing Citizen Four last night, uh, I mean, this feels like something out of the movie. I had to go and pick up the machine and receive it from the source. And it's so ridiculous. I had to drive up to New York City and double park my car outside a Times Square hotel. I then went into the alleyway behind the hotel where a man in the trench coat gave me a black leather suitcase containing the voting machine. <laughs> anyway, we spent a summer working in secret to reverse engineer it, and I don't know what the big secret is. It's basically a PC inside a fancy case with a touchscreen, a removable memory card to load the ballot design and unload the votes. Anyway, we figured out some interesting things about its security. So it turned out that it was just a normal operating system kernel and an application that uh, read and totaled the votes. And um, by doing some funny things with the memory card, you could cause the machine to replace its software without any cryptographic checks with whatever software you wanted. So uh, we came up with an application called uh, the Stuffer that uh, you could load into the machine uh, it would present a nice UI on the touchscreen, let you pick who you wanted to vote and by how much. It would then proceed to change every record of the vote because this machine just maintained the votes in electronic memory. In that way, you could, uh, say, have an election between George Washington and Benedict Arnold, the famous traitor of the American Revolution. And uh, whenever we would do this election, Benedict Arnold would always win because we had tampered with the machine. This is so easy to do that even a, a bunch of, um, I, in my case, naive grad students could pull it off in a few weeks um, thanks to the computerization of the vote. Um, we also discovered that thanks to the computerization of the technology, we could create a voting machine virus that would spread on those memory cards from machine to machine to machine in the course of a normal election cycle so that someone who had just a few minutes alone with one voting machine could change the election outcome in an entire state. That's really the, uh, the danger of e-voting to me, is not just that tampering is possible, tampering is possible with paper ballots too. It's that tampering, because of the power of computerization, can be much more wide scale with a very small conspiracy and also very hard to detect. But this isn't the only study that's shown problems in e-voting. I was part of a study uh, that the California Secretary of State, Deborah Bowen, in the middle there, commissioned uh, also in 2007 that reviewed every electronic voting technology in use in California. And we studied machines from three manufacturers, Hart, Sequoia, and Diebold. Believe it or not, each of these machines is based on source code uh, in the hundreds of thousands of lines of code. They're too complicated to possibly be secure. So it was no surprise that all of these machines were susceptible to vote-stealing code and also to attacks that would let election officials violate the secret ballot and find out how everyone voted. As a result, all of these machines were decertified and banned from use in the state of California. But it's not just a U.S. problem. In Europe, too, uh, people have been experimenting with e-voting. And one of the seminal studies in Europe was conducted by my friend Rob Honkreip, who's sitting here in the front row. Round of applause for Rob. So Rop and his collaborators studied the NADAP ES3B machines that were being introduced that were introduced in the Netherlands, and they discovered that by just easily changing uh, an EEPROM chip that they could do in, uh, I think they demonstrated in less than a minute, um, they could cause the machine to steal votes, to be dishonest, even to play chess. <laughs> Inspired by Rob, um, I and uh, colleague Ari Feldman uh, took a machine that's uh, still in use in many parts of the U.S. and uh, a few years later converted it into a, a pretty good Pac-Man machine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just the U.S. and Europe. India, too, uses electronic voting. It's both the world's largest democracy and the world's largest user of e-voting. Uh, they have these uh, homegrown, very beautiful, very simple embedded system voting machines. Um, it's too long a story to, uh, 
tell the whole thing today, but uh, about um, four years ago now, um, uh, an anonymous source, a whistleblower, gave one of these secret government-made machines to this man in the center, Hari Prasad, to study. And he called me and Rob, and we went to India and investigated it. As I say, it's too long a story, but the uh, a long story short, this ended up with Harry being jailed for a while, uh, Rop and I almost being deported from the country, and just recently, the Indian Supreme Court ruling that they have to introduce a paper trail uh, so that Indian voters can have a uh, reasonable assurance that their votes have been securely counted. But internet voting. Internet voting is even harder than voting on a, just a, uh, a standalone machine in a polling place, right? Because internet voting, you have the problem that the voter is using their own machine outside a protected environment where they're, they might be vulnerable to being coerced, to having their usernames and passwords stolen, to imposter sites claiming to be the real voting system, to malware on their, uh, their machines, even to uh, botnets that have already infected large numbers of machines, compromising the outcome of the election. And it's not only that, the server too has to be able to resist denial of service. Remember, an election takes place during a fixed period, so you can't say, well, our system is down this week, we'll postpone the internet voting portion until next month. That's not going to fly. You have to worry about insider attacks on the server, about remote intrusion, even about more advanced attacks like uh, state-sponsored threats. How many countries do you think might want to affect the outcome of a major country's national election? There are probably a growing number of sophisticated states with that desire and ability. But at the same time, internet voting systems are more difficult to study. You can't just uh, rely on someone to, you know, bring you a machine in the middle of the night when, uh, when the going gets tough. You also can't hack into the server during the election. You can't ethically do that. Because, you know, as a researcher, as someone who's trying to improve the state of democratic technology, um, I can't possibly justify anything that might risk interfering with the conduct or the outcome of the election myself. And so we've had to look for other opportunities to study these things in other ways. And one of the best examples that I've been able to find so far has been an incident in 2010 where Washington, D.C., um, decided to introduce an internet voting system. They got a big government grant to build this thing. And it was for use by military and overseas voters sending in absentee ballots. Now, they did a lot of things right. They uh, did it as an open source system, hired some of the, some really experienced uh, web developers. Um, they even called in security researchers and asked us, well, how should we build our new internet voting system? And the researchers all said, no, no, internet voting, it's too dangerous. We don't know, don't do it. But DC did it anyway. But as maybe a compromise or maybe to tell us to, uh, you know, uh, put our money where our mouths were, um, they decided to hold a public trial and say that the week before the election, we're going to hold a mock election and anyone in the world who wants to try to hack in and show us how vulnerable this is can do so. <laughs> Well, it's not every day that you're invited to hack into government computers without going to jail. And so uh, I got together a team of my students and we decided to take them up on that. So here's what their system looked like. You'd log in, nice pretty web interface, download a ballot, fill it out in a PDF reader, upload it again, and that's it. Thank you for voting. Uh, tell your friends on Facebook and Twitter. Nice and shiny. This is... <laughs> Anyway, um, so the week before the election, these guys, Eric uh, Wister and Scott Walchuk and I, uh, got together in my office one night, stayed up pretty late, reading the source code that they had published uh, in a nice GitHub repo for us. And we read the DC source code, and it was maybe a few hours into it, uh, three, four o'clock in the morning, 
uh, we were looking at this procedure here, and this is uh, Ruby on Rails, which uh, none of us had ever seen before, um, but we, we were able to sort of figure out what was going on. This highlighted line here, the voting system is using GPG to encrypt the uploaded ballot um, so that it would be secure, secret, until it was time to count the votes when they would be moved to another machine and decrypted with a private key stored there. The uh, problem turns out to be right here. They're using double quotes instead of single quotes. That was enough to let us hack in and steal all the votes. <laughs> so the problem is that this allows a script injection attack because this particular library they were using, the, the version they were using, just assembled a string and used the system call to pass it to bash. And it was good in that it sanitized the base name of the file, but it didn't sanitize the extension. So if you used an extension that had uh, some bash commands in it, why, they would be executed at the shell under the user permissions of the web server process that was accepting ballots and uh, 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 running the election. Um, this was the, example, the first example we tried and it worked. Anyway. <laughs> We also found on the same network um, some other interesting devices, uh, including a series of webcams that didn't have any usernames and passwords that were in the data center. So here are the machines that were running the election. Here are the workers. Uh, here's the security guard. He doesn't know that we're hacking into the server. <laughs> um, but this was actually very useful because we could tell by monitoring these guys whether they were suspicious that uh, anything was amiss. And in fact, we saw a marked change in their behavior, their posture, after eventually they found out that we had uh, gained control of the system. They were not too happy. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm getting just a little bit ahead of myself. Finally, it was time in DC to attack the system. So we waited until five o'clock when I knew from the surveillance videos that the citizens typically went home for the night. Um, at that point, uh, we started using this shell injection vulnerability to execute remote commands. In fact, we, we built a kind of um, uh, uh, simulated shell that would uh, do the right thing to compile something into a ballot, upload the ballot, execute the command, leak it back out via putting something in a public path on the web server, and basically make it look like we had a command line. Anyway, from there, we proceeded to attack the system, playing the role of a real attacker. So you're a real attacker. You've hacked into the voting system. What is the first thing you do? Does it steal all the, all the votes? Well, no. In fact, the first thing you do is steal everything else you can get your hands on that might let you get back into the system. You establish persistence. The second thing we did was steal all the votes. <laughs> <laughs> and we replaced them with uh, our own ballot where each candidate was a write-in candidate, an evil robot or AI from sci-fi or the movies. Who would the computers vote for if they were uh, in charge? At that point, we rigged the system to replace any new votes with votes of our choosing. We added a back door that would uh, reveal the secret ballots of anyone else who, votes, who voted. And we cleared the logs to try to hide all the traces. Now, we just had one more dilemma which is that we had gained complete control of the system, but the real election was then about a week away. And um, we wanted to let DC know what happened, but we didn't want to just call them on the phone because we thought it would be really, really interesting to test how well election officials could detect and respond to an attack during a simulated election. And there's never been uh, a good example, a good study of how this would play out. So instead of just calling them up, we decided to leave a, uh, we thought, not so subtle calling card. So what we did was we changed the source code to that thank you page at the end, the thing that says, uh, tell your friends you voted on, on Facebook and Twitter. And we added a few lines right here. This would, after a few second delay, cause the voter's computer to start playing the University of Michigan's football fight song, Hail to the Victors. <laughs> So 
So it was still almost two days before the election officials noticed, and it was only when someone else called them up and said, uh, the system seems fine to me, but I don't like the music that plays at the end. It's distracting. <laughs> So at that point, I think they looked around, realized they were all fans of a rival football team and uh, had a terrible sinking feeling. Anyway, DC ended up doing a smart thing. They did not use the internet voting system to receive votes. Instead, to help absentee voters cast votes in a timely way, they let you download a blank ballot, print it out, and send it back in the mail. So by doing that, they eliminated most of the risk and met the voters who needed to get their ballots back in time halfway. All right, so this is the best study we've had so far. And it brings us to the topic, the main topic of today's talk, internet voting in Estonia. So Estonia is a really, really interesting case, and I've been following for years what has been happening with Estonia's internet voting system, because Estonia, more than any other country in the world, has deployed uh, and, and utilized internet voting. Um, so for those of you who don't know where Estonia is, including most of the Americans in the audience, it's right here. So you can see that it borders Russia. It's also a member of the EU for you Americans. It's also a member of NATO. So Estonia is a, actually quite a technologically developed country. They're a leader in e-government. They're doing lots of interesting experiments with ways to provide services to the people over the internet. So it's no, um, within that context, it's a little bit less of a surprise that a country like Estonia um, would be experimenting with internet voting. And yet Estonia has done more than just run a few trials. Um, over the past uh, decade, they have now uh, conducted, I, I believe it is seven elections over the internet, um, including in the most recent election in May of this year for European Parliament, more than 30% of all votes were cast over the internet. So that's just incredible. There's no other country that comes close to relying that heavily on the internet for votes in national elections, 30% and more. And yet, um, whether the Estonian system is secure um, is a question that has not been, had not been adequately answered. Um, in fact, uh, be, there were not, there was not until we got there anyway, um, an independent international study um, that examined in detail uh, the technology and its security implications. And because of this, many other countries, including my own, had people looking around, wow, Estonia, look at that, they're voting online, why can't we do that? Wouldn't that be great if we could vote over the internet? So I wanted to know, and my students wanted to know, and many of my friends, you know, has Estonia actually solved the problem of voting online securely? Um, have they defined their system in a way that it would answer the kinds of realistic threats that major countries face in conducting elections? And what can my country, what can all of our other countries learn from Estonia's example? So I was looking for many, many years for an opportunity to go to Estonia, to meet the people there, to study the system, and to try to answer these questions in the context of e-voting research. So um, finally, I had this opportunity in October of last year when I was invited, along with uh, a, a team of other international researchers, um, by the city of Tallinn government to come to the country to talk about our experiences with e-voting and to be an observer in the national election, to actually see the process of uh, the e-voting um, system being administered. So we were official credentialed election observers. Uh, we got to uh, tour the data center where the, uh, the uh, servers um, conducting the election were housed. Uh, we got to meet many of the system developers and I uh, interviewed them extensively, including people like Tarvi Martins, the father of the system, who actually um, gave a talk about it at, I think, the 25C3 years ago. Tarvi is uh, one of the lead developers. It's uh, his, his baby. And so it was a great pleasure to get to talk to him one-on-one -on -one for an extended period to spend a day with him and to learn how the system worked. 
Um, we also got to examine the source code because Estonia just last year um, released for the first time partial source code to their voting system. They released the source code to the server. Uh, the client is still closed source. They're asking you to install a closed source program on your computer. They say this is to prevent um, people from building dishonest lookalike software, or at least to make that harder. Um, we also got to review, and this is a really interesting thing they do, we got to review dozens of hours of video footage that Estonia posts during the election of them doing all of the pre-election server configuration, of them doing the daily backups in the data center. Really interesting that they provide this, uh, and it gave us uh, the ability to fill in a lot of the, the gaps, the blanks, in how the system was actually being run. <laughs> So um, the next thing I want to show you is what the system looks like from the voter's perspective. So if you're a voter in Estonia, um, you go to uh, cast your vote. Uh, you have about a week to do this um, prior to the uh, in-person election day. And um, you log in from your computer and download an application. And there's, there's only one thing in this picture that might look unusual to other people, and that's this. What's that? Well, Estonia, one of the really interesting things that they've done with computer technology is their national ID cards are all smart cards. And in fact, every citizen in the country has one of these IDs that has a pair of RSA keys embedded into this chip. And you're able to use them both to authenticate to uh, web servers using uh, HTTPS uh, TLS client auth. Uh, they're one of the only countries where that's widely adopted. Um, or to sign documents, and they have a legally binding, accepted by the government, uh, e-document format that accepts signatures from these cards. Um, so many countries have attempted to do things like this, but Estonia is unique in that th this is actually widely used. M many, many people, a large fraction of Estonians, use these cards to bank online, uh, they use these to file their tax returns, they use them for uh, uh, accessing healthcare services online. Um, it's actually widely used. And uh, I, I think it's fantastic that they've been able to roll out a national PKI and see it adopted. So it's no surprise, really, that they based the whole design on the voting system on the capabilities and functions that these cards provide. So as an Estonian going to vote online, the first thing you do is go to an official website and uh, download a client application. And this is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Then you install the client on your computer and you proceed to interact with it using your smart card, your national ID, um, to cast your vote. So here's how it works. So um, the first thing that you do is you run the application and it asks you for uh, a four-digit PIN. Uh, this PIN is required by the smart card in order to activate um, the uh, authentication and signing functions and let it use the keys. After that, it connects to the election server, authenticates via TLS client auth, figures out where you live, and sends the ballot to the application. You just get to pick who you want to vote for in the app. Um, there's a new application for each election, by the way. Um, at that point, uh, you click cast your vote, and uh, the election software um, proceeds to do some crypto. So here's what it does. It does two things. First, it's going to encrypt your ballot choices using RSA and using um, some uh, padding randomness uh, that's been generated by the client. Then it's going to take that encrypted ballot and um, sign it, digitally sign it, using your national ID card. So this second step where it digitally signs it results in the signed ballot and the signed encrypted ballot goes up to the election servers where it's stored until it's time to count the votes. So that's the voting process in a nutshell, very simple. Next though, Estonia has a, a feature that's been introduced just in the last few years that lets you do something uh, that they, they call verification. So the last thing the election client software does is it shows you this QR code. And the QR code contains two things, um, a ballot ID, and um, the random coins that were used to pad the uh, ballot before RSA encryption. 
Um, using those things, you can use a smartphone application, and this is now available for iOS and, and uh, Android, to scan the QR code. The um, app then uh, queries the election servers, and the servers send back an encrypted ballot with the signature stripped off. So this is claiming, the server is claiming that this is the ballot it received from you. Okay, at that point, using the uh, random coins that it got from the QR code, the smartphone app can try to brute force your ballot choice. Um, it can uh, try each possible choice until it finds one that encrypts to the same thing. Okay, then it, it finds a matching one, and it displays the resulting candidate. Um, as a safeguard against coercion, uh, this validation procedure can only be done up to three times, and it can only be done for up to 30 minutes after the ballot is cast. Otherwise, uh, someone who wanted to coerce you could just uh, say, here, show me uh, your verification. Interestingly, as another safeguard against coercion, you have the ability to replace your vote as many times as you want up until uh, the in-person election. So you just do the process again, and your new vote takes the place of your old vote. Only the most recently cast is counted. All right, so that's the verification process. Now, how does counting work? Counting is interesting in the Estonian system because it's basically just trying to do the cryptographic analog to um, the double envelope absentee ballots that uh, are used in many countries. Basically, with a double envelope absentee ballot, you have an inner security envelope that contains your ballot. Um, then you have an outer envelope that uh, contains your name and signature. When it comes time to count, they strip off your name and signature after checking that you have only voted once and you're entitled to vote. Then they separate the inner security envelopes, shuffle them up so they can't be matched to the names, open them, and count the votes. Well, in the Estonian system, they're doing something very similar. So the election servers store up the votes until it's time to count. And then um, they take those signed encrypted ballots, strip off the signatures, and burn them uh, onto a DVD. So they take this DVD and use it to move the encrypted ballots to a physically separated air-gapped machine called the counting server. And only the counting server has access to the private key that is used to decrypt the ballots. So they're encrypted all the way from your client to the counting server. And the counting server can decrypt them and see the votes, um, but uh, it never sees the signatures that identify them. So in that way, they attempt to maintain the secrecy of the ballot. The output of the counting server is simply the election results. Um, they're added in with in-person votes, and the winner is declared. So that's the Estonian process, and uh, it was really interesting to figure out quite how it worked. There are no published descriptions in English that uh, cover the uh, the entire thing prior to our, our study. We had to actually ask people and review the source code and all of that in order to get a good idea of what was really happening. The next question, though, after you understand how the system works, is what threats does it face? And um, really, um, we've reviewed already some of the problems with, uh, with internet voting, you know, insider attacks by dishonest election officials, people coercing the voters, malware on the client. But who else would want to attack such a system? Well, um, Estonia brings some particular examples to mind. Um, because, first of all, Estonia, very notably, was hit in 2007 by some of the um, earliest examples of um, what, what many observers considered to be state-on-state -state cyber warfare, when they suffered large-scale denial-of-service attacks against uh, uh, national infrastructure from groups associated with Moscow. Secondly, just this past summer, um, Ukraine had uh, its um, uh, post-revolution election. And during that election, there were widespread attacks against the election infrastructure itself. Now, that election wasn't conducted online, um, but the tabulation process, the process of bringing together all of the results from across the country, relied on networked computers to uh, receive votes and uh, publish the totals online. 
Um, that process was reportedly attacked by uh, groups thought to be linked to Russia as well, who attempted to discredit the election, and I, I read, even attempted to cause it to release the wrong results. Um, so all of this became public this last summer. I mean, this leads me to believe that the right threat model for an Internet voting system has to include sophisticated state-level attackers who might want to influence the national result. And for a country like Estonia, you know, an EU and NATO member that borders Russia, there are probably many sophisticated state-level attackers who might want to say in its future alignments. All right, so with that threat model in mind, let's evaluate the design of Estonia's system. And there are two components of the Estonian design um, that um, just by reviewing the design you can tell are implicitly trusted components. And you know, in security, when we say something is trusted, we mean basically that if it's hacked into, we're shit out of luck. So that's what we mean by trusted. These two components are the voter's client and the counting server. And let me tell you why both of these are um, uh, uh, potential vulnerability points or serious vulnerability points in the Estonian design. Well, let's start with the client. So the voter's client in Estonia um, potentially could be compromised by client-side malware. So here's a simple design for malware and something we actually implemented in the lab. Um, to implement these attacks, by the way, we've reproduced the complete Estonian system in our laboratory using their server-side source code, their documented procedures, and by reverse engineering the client to change it to talk to our servers and use our keys instead of the official ones. So we set up a complete mock election in the lab, and we have VM images on our website if anyone wants to try playing with it in their lab. Anyway, so imagine you have a voter's client and you're able to get some malware onto it. That malware could just basically tap in to the election client process and steal the uh, voter's pin as it's typed in during the real election. Then later, um, the next time the voter puts in their national ID card, say to bank online, uh, that malware can just invisibly in the background use that stolen pin to cast a replacement vote. The voter never finds out, the vote is changed, and um, the, uh, uh, the attacker is able to steal one vote by that procedure. Now, there are two big questions here, how to infect clients and how to defeat that verification app. So how to infect clients? Well, we have to leave this a little bit to the imagination because uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, a, a pre-existing botnet infecting thousands of computers in Estonia to play with. But other people do. And uh, <laughs> so one way, that's one way you could easily imagine changing thousands of votes. Another way would be by, uh, if you were, say, the NSA, you have your stockpile of O-days, you just uh, attack some popular um, website or application used in Estonia, and thereby infect people's clients with the malware. A third way might be to smuggle in malicious code with the official voting application, which is something we know that everyone who's voting online in Estonia is installing just prior to the election. Anyway, there are various ways you might infect the clients. Then how to defeat the verification app? Well, this turns out not to be all that complicated because um, thanks to their anti-coercion schemes, remember this tension between integrity and ballot secrecy, thanks to their anti-coercion schemes, the uh, verification app um, uh, can only be used for 30 minutes after the election is over, so after the vote is cast. So all we need to do is wait. If that doesn't work, if that's too suspicious, we could also try a hybrid attack involving a malicious Android app and uh, compromising the voter's client. Thanks to the convergence of these platforms, it really isn't so hard to believe anymore that someone could simultaneously and in a correlated way attack both. Anyway, there are various ways to do both of these things. We can move on and look at the server side too. Now the server side, the Achilles heel of the system is this counting server. It's the only thing that gets to manipulate the um, unencrypted votes. And nobody ever sees those votes, they just see the output. So if the counting server lies, right? If the counting server lies, then it can just arbitrarily say what the election outcome is. 
But they tried to make it pretty hard to manipulate the counting server. It's air-gapped. It's built before the election. It's sealed. It's uh, in a safe somewhere. We have to imagine that it's fairly difficult. So somehow you need a way to tamper with the uh, performance of code on that machine. Now, we experimented with and actually built a tool chain to do this and compromise that machine uh, even with the security procedures they have in place. So our tool chain um, basically draws on the idea uh, from Ken Thompson's Reflections on Trusting Trust, which says that even if one system is secure, right, you needed some other system to build it, right? And you needed some other system to build that one. So if you follow that chain, eventually you'll come to some place that the attacker has access to. So in our um, investigation, we found out that the way they build that machine for the counting server, it runs, uh, I, I think, a Debian variant, and uh, that is installed from a DVD. That DVD is burned in a separate development machine that is built uh, before the election and actually downloads a fresh copy of Debian from the web and uh, burns the DVD. So let's assume we can step back a few, um, a, a few uh, levels from the counting server and compromise that dev server. It is on the internet. It is built before the video recording starts at the beginning of the election. Let's say we can get some malware on that. So we built a demonstration where that malware infects the uh, uh, installation CD that's burned, um, uses a rootkit to lie about the, uh, the SHA-1 hash of that uh, uh, ISO image because they are checking it. And uh, then that uh, compromised DVD proceeds to install some backdoor code into the counting server when it's built. At that point, changing votes is really easy. All we have to do um, is uh, intercept um, some code in the counting server that uses an attached HSM to do the decryption of each vote and uh, basically look at what comes back from the HSM and replace it with a vote of our choosing. This way, it takes approximately the right amount of time. The HSM uh, decrypts the real votes, but the results are fraudulent. Okay, so these are two attacks that rely a little bit on some capabilities that we don't have, right? Uh, access to ODES or a botnet or insider access. All things that the real attackers do have, though. But still, it might be possible that Estonia's operational security is so good that these advanced attackers would have problems compromising the machines. So how good is their operational security? Um, this was a big question in our work and something that we spent a lot of time reviewing the videos, doing the interviews to find out. All right, so um, the president of Estonia, this guy, says that their security is better than Google's. Um, this is the uh, standard that they've, uh, they've set for themselves. That's, that's good. That's something to aspire to. Let's see how good their security actually is based on the official videos that they published during the election. All right, so here's Tarvi Martins. Here above his head is the Wi-Fi SSID and password for the network they're using. All right, here uh, they are building um, some of the, the software and the servers and the configuration for the real machines. Um, let's zoom in on their whiteboard here. Oh dear, okay, so they're using some Windows shareware they're downloading over HTTP in order to write the configuration files for the servers. This doesn't look good. All right, um, let's move on. Here's another computer. They're uh, testing out the client software in this uh, screenshot here. Let's zoom in. You can see the desktop pretty well. Oh, wait a minute, what are, what are all these icons on the desktop? Uh, here's uh, some poker site, uh, BitTorrent client, I think this is pirated music, oh dear. All right, so this is not a, you know, a clean, secure machine. Uh, I hope they're not doing anything important. <laughs> oh my, all right, here they are signing, digitally signing the official voting client that they're going to ask everyone in the country to download and install on their computers. Oh my gosh, this is like the most dangerous possible thing to have the real client binary on a potentially compromised machine. So if someone compromises this machine, they can get their malware into the official voting client and distribute it to every Estonian voter. 
All right. Um, what else? Oh, uh, later in that same machine, um, there's Tarvi's name. I think this is Tarvi Martin's personal laptop. Oh. All right. Here uh, they are setting up one of the servers. They're logging in as root. You can see the keystrokes. <laughs> uh, here's someone entering their PIN for their national ID card. Uh, here in the data center, uh, this is really useful. This big key here, uh, the big key there is the one that opens the data center door. <laughs> Anyone have a 3D printer? <laughs> All right, so this doesn't seem to be the level of, ne of um, uh, the level of operational security that we would need to defend against state-level attackers. But I don't want to be too harsh on them. This is the level of, of operational security that's typical in a government IT system. But this isn't just a government IT system. This is determining who the next leadership will be. This is a national security critical system. All right, here's one more thing that happened. So they had some things go wrong after uh, in the uh, election, uh, in the last election, including that um, uh, at the end when it was time to copy the official results out of the counting server, the DVD burner wouldn't work. And so they looked around, well, how are we going to do this? Well, uh, we're going to, uh, we have to copy them off and bring them onto another system to digitally sign them and publish them. Well, so Tarvi Martins pulled the USB stick out of his pocket and put it into that, uh, that counting server, you know, the only thing that knows what the real votes are, and then plugged it into his Windows laptop and signed the votes and published them. So here's what appeared on his Windows laptop when he plugged in the, uh, the USB stick. And you can see that it's been all all over the place. It has a talk about the voting system he gave on there. Um, this is not a clean USB stick. So yet another potential route for malware to get into the counting server. All right, so this was our assessment that uh, the Estonian system had serious potential vulnerabilities, especially against a state-level adversary. And um, there was no way that um, the operational security they had in place was going to resist it. And we were in a bit of a predicament because we had been to Estonia the previous uh, October and um, told the election officials basically that we had these concerns. And then we went and we confirmed them to ourselves in the laboratory. So now Estonia had another election coming up in May 2014. We knew this information. What would we do with it? We knew the election officials were already convinced that the system was just fine. So we decided to go public with the information. And unfortunately, because we all had a lot of other projects going on, um, it got pushed off until more close to the election than I was comfortable with. And we went to Estonia just uh, about 10 days before their next election to tell the public what we had discovered. So we flew, we got to see Tallinn, beautiful city. We uh, set up a hacker base camp in a, a nice big Airbnb place um, uh, with, I think, uh, the, the whole team present. And we proceeded to call a press conference and announce our findings. We put up a website that uh, summarized them as I have now for uh, normal people to understand. And we published uh, a, uh, a detailed technical report that was later published at the ACMCCS conference. So the reaction and understanding the reaction requires understanding just two things about Estonian politics. One, that uh, there are these two major parties, the Estonian Reform Party and the Estonian Center Party. The Reform Party, which is currently the, uh, running the national government, loves the voting system. It's their puppy dog. It's the, uh, one of their sources of national pride. They want to market it to the rest of Europe and show how outstanding and modern Estonia is. The Estonian Center Party, which has previously been in, uh, in charge of the national government, is currently the minority party, but they control the city of Tallinn, the, the, basically the city-state within the country. Um, they hate the e-voting system, possibly because they keep losing elections. Um, the parties out of power always hate uh, or are willing to criticize the technology, and the parties in power never are. Anyway, the center party has criticized the system for a long time, and the reform party loves it. 
Unfortunately, every media outlet in Estonia seems to be closely affiliated with one or the other of these two parties. And so everyone covered the um, potential results, the, the potential attacks we found, but they either covered it saying that this proves that the elections were fraud, or uh, there's some people attacking the e-voting system because they're working for our rival party. So we've landed in the middle of all of this, and it was, uh, it was rather incredible, but not so much fun. Um, uh, so it was major news for, uh, for a week, and at the beginning of every nightly news program, I flew home on the plane with uh, people in the rows next to me reading newspapers with stories about this. It was the weirdest experience ever. We also got to meet the election officials uh, in a very formal meeting with them and their lawyer. And Tarvi Martins thanked us very much and told us that uh, they had already accounted for all of this and there was no problem. Um, all right, we also got to have some drinks with the uh, security people working for the election um, who were very convinced that everything was all right um, because they told us the right people kept winning. <laughs> Well, I asked them, well, what, what would happen if by some horrible, uh, horrible error, the wrong people won, fired all of you, and just kept running the system exactly as it is? And they, they sort of had frowny faces and said, well, that would be pretty bad. But <laughs> um, later, though, Harry Hursty, one member of our team, who is um, a, a very large Finnish man and uh, known as a prodigious drinker, went out for serious drinking with this very nice Russian fellow who is the head of security for the election operations team. Uh, during this dinner, I am told each man consumed two bottles of vodka, after which nothing can be, uh, nothing can be uh, hidden from the truth. So Harry reports that by the end of this evening, he had drank that root password out of the head of security. <laughs> And here he is coming back. Oh. All right. So one one last thing to wrap up. So the president of the prime minister of Estonia went on TV and said he had Facebooked us, and we were working for his opponents to discredit the system, because apparently Jason Kitkat was friends with someone in the mayor's office. He was also friends with the Prime Minister's Minister of Finance and had an outstanding Facebook friend request with the Prime Minister, but uh, apparently he never accepted it. Um, finally, uh, we had some very interesting... I've never been attacked on TV by the uh, Prime Minister of a NATO country before, especially for whom my friends were. Finally, um, we had some interesting official responses online from the Estonian election authorities. Uh, they say that the verification app detects all bad behavior. Yes, all right, we've talked about the verification app. Uh, they also say, why steal votes when you can steal money if you could do all of this? Well, <laughs> all right, I don't really buy that either. But the most surprising thing was Estonian's, Estonia's cert came out with a blog post. You can find this online in English also. The title of the post is, E-voting is too secure. Oh dear. Nice people who care about computer hygiene have no viruses, they say. In practice, computer risks have been eliminated in the voting system. Uh, there, he, there, my team is there because, not because of technical savvy, but they're politically suitable but technically incompetent message. Oh dear. Well, I don't think we're going to have much luck convincing Estonia um, to, uh, to change their voting system. However, we can take away some lessons for other countries. The i-voting system is in fact not secure against the kind of national threats, um, state level actors that could potentially be targeting modern countries conducting national level e-voting. Um, it's a national security issue, not an IT problem. And so if you're even thinking of implementing such a system, you need to be pursuing a totally different threat model and level of defense. Politics, unfortunately, as we saw, can obscure major technical problems. And in your country, if your country is considering adopting such a system, please be wary of that. Our recommendation is Estonia should discontinue their internet voting system until their fundamental security advances. Um, but uh, I hope I don't have any... <clears throat> I don't have much hope for them. But just to conclude, 
here's what I see as the fundamental problem with internet voting, that we want voting systems where you or I or our friends or Tarvi Martins or Vladimir Putin or the NSA can't just hack in and change the election outcome. It's as simple as that. We want democracy. Major fraud, major fraud needs to be at least as hard as it is on paper, and no technology so far can assure that. For this reason, my take, even though I know about all of the promising research along these lines, is that it's still going to be decades, if ever, until internet voting can be secure enough for use in major national elections, and not without fundamental advances in computer security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very scary and very entertaining talk. <laughs> so, we are a bit over time, but fortunately we have a break in Saal 1 after this talk. So, if you have any questions, please line up behind uh, one of the eight microphones. <clears throat> yeah, number four, please. Thanks for the talk. Um, you you explored how you can change, uh, attack the vote, uh, the counting server, but have you uh, looked into um, whether you can uh, do this other server, uh, you know, whether you can attack this other server, because the signatures are stripped, if I uh, remember correctly, so yes. the, the, uh, the other server could just burn arbitrary encrypted votes on the DVD. Well, Isn't that right? Yes, so that is indeed another vulnerability. Um, we concentrated just on the counting server because that was maybe the um, what we considered to be the, the most interesting version of this attack. But there are other places you could potentially um, be attempting that too. I think that would have a little bit more forensic evidence. We do also know, though, that in terms of the front-end servers, um, we, we know that the servers used in 2013 were vulnerable to Heartbleed, of course only <laughs> discovered months later. Um, I suspect they were vulnerable to Shellshock as well. Um, it's a real, really a problem if you're implementing a system like this, no matter how careful you are. Question from number three, please. Um, yes. Um, so my question is: uh, Was there like any any testing of the counting server? I could imagine that, for example, you could uh, just produce a big heap of uh, sample DVDs where you know what the vote is, and then run these on the system. Maybe yeah. even even on election day that you say, "Here are ten sample DVDs. Here's the real vote," and we we do a random order and run them several times and, and then see if, 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 if all of the sample DVDs are fine in, a, in, in any order, then the vote is, will also be fine, something like that? Yes, so um, they don't have any procedures like that in place. I think they're thinking of adding such things, but there's subtleties involved there. If you're building such a thing, you have to make sure that there's no way that the malware can detect whether it's an audit or whether it's the real vote that it's counting. And um, because of, say, side channels or secret knocks, um, you could plant some signal in the sample files that would count them, ca cause them to be counted correctly. So you have to be very, very careful in the design of such a system. Um, my worry is not so much that um, uh, none of these problems can be corrected, as that correcting all of them perfectly is going to result in a system that's too complicated to conduct and to administer. It's just going to result in a Rube Goldberg system. I think that's why the system is as it is, because they had to make compromises in order to build a system that was cheap enough and easy enough to run. And uh, so, yeah, we can think of some improvements to each component, but closing all of the holes sounds extremely difficult, at least to me. Question from number four, please. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really inspiring. And uh, I wanted to ask what you think on the question whether such systems could ever evolve as being secure enough 
as I see uh, mm. the developments that take place in security are always um, triggered by hackers, um, not, not only, but yes. um, like the security holes are being filled as they're detected. So it's like a race between the two that make systems yes. evolve. So, so I wonder if it can ever... It's a great security. question. And there's a really promising area of research on this, something called end-to-end -end voter verifiable voting that's uh, based on some, uh, some advanced cryptography. The idea here is basically you want a system that ensures your vote is cast as you intended, that it's counted as cast, that all votes are counted as cast, and that every voter can confirm these. One way you could get this is just by publishing everyone's name and how they voted in a newspaper, right? But of course, we don't want that. It's not a secret ballot. But by using some more advanced versions of cryptography, we can get that too. Believe it or not, it's really counterintuitive that you can have all these properties. So there are such systems in the works. And if you're interested in trying to hack on these things and make them better, looking at these systems is a great place to start. But they're not ready for prime time. There are lots of questions about usability, about the security of the protocols, about the complexity of the implementation, about whether they could be run properly at a national scale. Um, so there's hope. There's hope coming from research. But I still think that it's at least a decade away, and that's if things go well, before it's ready for prime time. It's a great question, though. May I ask another short question? Um, how would you think that um, end users are going to be able to trust in such systems as they are not developers, as we are here? Uh, well, that's, so that's they, they really... They have no means of yeah. verifying that there is no fraud happening. That's really an open question. I mean, um, just thinking from the American context, I don't know how voters are going to react when their favorite uh, radio pundit goes on the air and says, the vote uh, was, uh, the election is a fraud. And some nerdy cryptographer goes on and says, well, no, I can prove it because this property of this, uh, you know, this mix net shows that this and that. You know, I don't think we know how to solve that problem yet. And uh, getting confidence and rational confidence is one of the big challenges in any election technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Number one has a question. So if these smart cards will sign TLS transcripts and documents on demand, are they really confident that no TLS handshake or document can ever pass as an encrypted ballot? Um, there are separate keys for authentication and signing. Um, and uh, so um, hopefully uh, they have thought about that attack. But that's uh, uh, an interesting question, Adam. That's not something we looked at. In fact, we said that the security of this um, uh, PKI was actually outside the, uh, the scope of our study. But uh, Tarvi Martins is also the father of the national PKI, so you could uh, talk to him about uh, uh, the security of the implementation and operations there. It seems he may not be entirely open to the question, but thanks. Um, number five has a question. Well, it's also like similar, like even if there were significant advances in uh, cryptography and uh, like how would, how would a citizen be confident in uh, in, in the system if, if the person is not a cryptographer and can't prove. And the other thing is, like, when you're a kid, you're told we have democracy, but when you grow up, you realize that there are lots of, like, skewed uh, results of some votes count more than others and so forth. So you have to be a political scientist to understand, like, how the votes are counted, and you have to be a cryptographer to understand that the count is accurate. Like, does any one person, like... <laughs> have all that knowledge and <laughs> I I know I know these are very difficult questions um, and I don't know the answers um, I can say that my belief of uh, what I personally think should be the case is that voters can, should be able to trust the election outcome without having to trust the election officials or any specialized cast of people, including the nerds or the cryptographers or the political scientists. It should be possible, it ought to be possible, for uh, someone to uh, you know, go with their friends, with their group, with their club, with their party, and observe the election process and establish rational confidence. It should be designed like that. I know that that's a problem. And uh, in fact, there are many ways we can try to use technology to give people ways to increase confidence, including means of um, electronically um, 
auditing elections on paper ballots that there's been a significant amount of research um, on um, that let you, with, without advanced, advanced crypto, with just some basic statistics, um, get additional confidence that the election outcome was right. So there are things we can do with technology, um, but I don't have all the answers. Number two, please. Hi. Uh, I'd like to ask um, if you are familiar with the workflow that uh, Bitcoins uh, works. Uh, do you consider a decryption and encryp an encryption and decryption uh, mechanism like this uh, to work in an electronic uh, election? Um, so some people have talked about building voting schemes based on uh, some uh, some variants of the Bitcoin um, protocol. I think it's an an interesting thought. Um, uh, I don't know that we want to trust the outcome of national elections even to the Bitcoin ecosystem because it could be that a uh, say the outcome of a U.S. presidential election is worth more than the Bitcoin economy. I don't know if that's true or not yet, but it's something to to think about. Uh, anyway, I think the the idea of a distributed public ledger as uh, used in Bitcoin is potentially a very interesting idea for future voting schemes. But again, it's, it seems pretty far out there compared to where the state of the art is now. Once more, number two, please. Yes. <clears throat> well, you, you found quite, uh, quite a lot of different problems uh, with their voting system. Could you evaluate uh, what proportion could be easily fixed and what is rather inherent to, to the system in itself and uh, would need uh, a major, a major re-engineering of the whole thing? Well, the inherent thing about all of these systems is that they rely on the correct and secure operation of some code that's just running in a machine where people can't see the votes. You can't verify the votes with your eyes, with your hands, because uh, they have to be processed in secret by a computer. And that kind of black box property is something that leads directly to the proposition that if that computer is somehow compromised, say through a supply chain attack or malware coming in through uh, one of these uh, reflections on trusting trust style attacks, then it can lead to compromising the election results. And that's a hard thing to fix. That's the thing that the end-to-end -end voter verifiability crypto eventually will try to fix. Um, the little things, the bugs, the shell injection, yeah, of course, those are easy problems to fix. But in reality, when you're operating an election and uh, there's some big vuln in one of the packages your stuff relies on that was patched last night and you don't have time to retest and re-audit all the code, you're faced with a choice of either shipping something that's been untested or shipping something that has known vulns. So I don't know how in our, our patch release cycle based security world we can deal with problems like that. I think that's something where, you know, we really need fundamental advances in the way we conduct ourselves with computer security before we can have a good solution to it. So, so overall you're saying that, uh, that there is no, no hope that there, that there could be such a system and uh, just pencil and paper uh, still, uh, still beats, uh, beats it as, as far as, uh, as the, uh, the required properties of the elections are concerned. Pencil and paper has the very nice property that you as a voter can tell how your vote has been recorded and that other people can observe the counting process. Now, we have hundreds of years of experience with fraud with paper ballots. So I'm not saying that there's nothing that technology can do to improve on that. We can do stuff. But that uh, I, I think that the most promising ways to improve on paper ballots don't start by throwing away the paper. They start with the paper and then add some other technology that's able to, uh, to track, to record, um, to, uh, to help to audit that paper record to make sure that, uh, the, that we can be confident in the result. Thank you. So maybe two, more, three, two or three more questions. Uh, number six, please. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to design a system with guarantees both the integrity of the votes and the votes to be anonymous? Because I think those, those two completely don't go together. Uh, there's certainly intention. Um, these E2E -E verifiable crypto systems attempt to do that. Um, but as I say, they have other problems with usability, with implementation that haven't all been solved. That's certainly the goal, but that's what makes it a hard problem. Um, and I think uh, that's uh, what we'd all 
like to be able to build. It's, uh, we, we don't know how to do that in large scale in practice yet. We're working on it. But that's not a guarantee that we'll ever be able to comfortably resolve those problems. I just want to quickly plug, shameless plug, for my students' talks and my colleagues' talks about other work we've been doing, by the way, that you might also enjoy hearing how we uh, are using our ZMAP scanning tool we built to uh, study heart bleed, how we bought a TSA naked scanner on eBay and found all these attacks against it, and how we're building, along with EFF and Mozilla, a free certificate authority that's going to uh, be our attempt to see the entire web get encrypted. So shameless plug. Thank you for staying. Number one, please. I want to thank you for the talk, but also for sharing your research in the form of a free online Coursera course, Secure and Digital Democracy. So I know it, you don't want to toot your own horn, but I'm doing it for you. Now, to make it a question after all, will there be an next edition? <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, I do. If you're interested in learning more, I have a, a free online um, five-week course uh, on uh, digital voting technology available on Coursera. Um, it is free. Um, it will uh, run again soon. In fact, uh, I'm in the process of releasing it essentially as a uh, an online textbook form of where you can just go and watch the video lectures at your own pace. So if you'd like to see the uh, 10 lecture version of this talk, um, you're, uh, you, can, you can find that at Coursera um, or find uh, uh, a link to it from my homepage. Thank you very, very much for bringing that up. Thank you all. Before we come to the last question from number four, I'd like to remind you, if you leave, please uh, take your trash with you and you can still uh, come up and ask the uh, speaker after the talk. So please, number four. My understanding of democratic elections is that they have to be free and private. So even um, if all the problems you mentioned would be fixed, wouldn't there still be the problem be left that... Uh, uh, voting at home is is not is not ensuring that the principle. So uh, imagine some family family member forcing all the other family members to to vote after what he wishes, because they they cannot vote in their in their own cabin. I agree with you completely that it's a very, very hard problem assuring the voter a, a safe and coercion-free environment when they're voting from uh, remotely over the internet. So, yeah, you can easily imagine a spouse or an employer coercing someone into voting a certain way. And Estonia's approach to that is interesting, this idea that they'll let the person cast a replacement vote. That makes coercion harder, um, but it doesn't rule it out. Right, the coercer could take the person's national ID card until the election is over to prevent them from casting a replacement vote. They could wait until the last minute and then force them just before the election closes to cast a replacement vote. Um, I do believe that this is one of the hard problems uh, and it's one of the, uh, the compromises that are made in our democratic principles uh, when we decide that internet voting is the way we want to go. Um, maybe there are technological approaches that can, uh, that can try to improve upon that. Um, but I'm not very confident that there are. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, a, a, an open problem where the answer is likely to be that coercion is simply, um, part of what you get in exchange for the potential convenience of voting online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. One round of applause, please. One more. Thank you. Thank you.